Hello and welcome to my channel IELTS Listening. Let's start with one of the best practice tests for improving listening skills. Trying to listen to the director of a college talking about his school. Listen to the talk and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Many of you already have a reasonably firm idea of the general subject area you wish to study. Others are more open and searching for ideas. Whatever your situation, I hope you find that we have a course that meets your needs. Our firm aim is to be a student-centred institution with a special emphasis on flexibility. This begins with our attitude to access. We judge people on their motivation and commitment to study as much as, if not more than, formal qualifications. This is reflected in the vitality and diversity of our student population. Some of our students come direct from sixth form or college before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Others are coming into higher education after a short or long gap from formal education. Some are seeking a specific set of skills with a particular job or profession in mind. Others are retraining or studying to give their careers a new direction or dimension. Some are learning about the very latest scientific, technological and commercial knowledge. Others are stretching their minds on sensitive environmental, social and cultural issues. Even a casual observation of the mix of our student body indicates that we're close to our aim of being a polytechnic for the whole community. To meet our students' needs, we have 500 academic and a further 500 support staff committed to good quality teaching, high standards and sensitive and sympathetic student care. We have probably the longest experience of understanding and dealing with the differing needs of a diverse student population. I hope you'll find a suitable course at the Polytechnic College if you want to come to the college and we consider you suitable, we'll do our best to find you a place. And when you're here, we'll work hard to make your experience enjoyable, stimulating and educationally rewarding. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide giving information about a shopping district. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15.
As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. This afternoon, we'll visit the city's shopping district. Several blocks in the area are closed to car traffic, and I know you'll enjoy walking around there. I'd like to give you an overview of the district now, since you'll be on your own once we get there. You'll see on this map here that the shopping district consists of two streets, Pear Street, which runs north and south, and Cherry Street, which crosses Pear Street right here. Let's start our tour here on Pear Street, where the star is. This star marks the Harbor View Bookstore. It's very popular among locals as well as tourists. You can buy a range of books of local interest as well as a variety of magazines and newspapers. It's directly across the street from the city library, which is also worth a visit. It's in one of the oldest buildings in the city and contains, among other things, an interesting collection of rare books. Now, moving up Pear from the bookstore toward Cherry, the next building on the left is the Pear Cafe. You'll notice it's right on the corner of Pear and Cherry Streets. It's a great place to relax while enjoying a delicious cup of coffee or tea. You can talk with friends or read quietly. They have a variety of books and magazines available. From the windows of the cafe, you can look right across Cherry Street for a lovely view of city gardens. It's a rather small garden, but it contains a variety of exotic plants and flowers. Let's leave the cafe and cross Pear Street. On the opposite corner, we're at Caldwell's Clothing Store, which you might also want to visit. They sell both men's and women's fashions from countries around the world. Continuing down Cherry Street, the next building on the right, after Caldwell's, is the Souvenir Shop. Stop in here to get maps and books about the local area, as well as t-shirts and postcards with pictures of the city. Now, we cross Cherry Street and we're at the Art Gallery, one building down from the corner. Here you can see, and of course, purchase, many fine paintings and sculptures by local artists. Let's keep going down Cherry Street toward the harbor. On the left, right after the gallery, is Harbor Park. It's a lovely place, and it's certainly worth spending some time there. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Harbor Park was built on land donated to the city by Captain Jones, a lifelong resident of this city. Captain Jones designed the park himself, and it was built in 1876. Exactly in the center of the park, a statue of Captain Jones was erected, and it's still standing there today. It shows Captain Jones on the bow of his ship. After viewing the statue, you can follow the path that goes through the woods just behind. It will lead you to a lovely garden, in the middle of which is a fountain. This is a nice place to enjoy a few quiet moments. If you still feel like walking, continue on to the far end of the garden. There you'll find a wooden staircase which will take you down to the harbor. You might enjoy the view of the boats from there. There's also a walking path along the water which will eventually bring you back up to Cherry Street. 
You can see that there's plenty to do in this part of the city. The bus leaves at 1.30. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor and two students discussing the crop rice. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good morning, everyone. So, following on from our tutorial on European agriculture last week, Daisy and Eric are going to talk about the most commonly grown crop in Asia, which is, of course, rice. Eric, can you tell us what you've been working on? Yes, yeah, sure. We've been looking at the role of rice in a number of countries, how it's grown, ways of increasing production. As I'm sure you know, rice is the staple diet throughout Asia and, in fact, 90% of the world's rice is grown and eaten there. Daisy's got some background on that. Um, well, rice was originally a wild plant which started out in the tropical regions of Asia. But there are literally hundreds of varieties today and each with different qualities. Uh, for instance, one will survive floods, while another will grow in relatively dry conditions. A third has a really lovely smell. But wherever it grows, rice needs a lot of water. What do you mean by a lot? Well, it takes about 5,000 litres to get a kilogram of rice. This can be supplied either naturally or by irrigation. And as most rice-growing countries suffer from unpredictable weather, including drought, water management really is the key. Research has become so important now that each rice-growing country in Asia has its own research institute. Whether we're talking about Japan, China or Bangladesh, and they're all coordinated by a group in the Philippines called the International Rice Research Institute. Interesting. Bangladesh, for instance, has been successfully using different rice varieties and fertilizers for 30 years. But because it's such a flat, delta country, it's very difficult for the water to drain away after the monsoon season. So they need to find special rice crops that can survive the floods. And with global warming, the situation is more urgent than ever. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Now I'd like to move on to our comparative study. As you can imagine, China is the world's biggest rice-producing country. Collectively, the Chinese people probably eat more than three billion bowls of rice every day. Quite a statistic. Mm. And of course, rice plays an important cultural role too. We then compared China to Thailand. You know, even though Thailand only has about 64 million people, it's the world's number one exporter of rice. Not China, as you might imagine. Is that so? Yes. They send their rice everywhere, in particular to Europe, as well as Africa and the Middle East. Apparently, the fact that jasmine rice is growing in popularity is one reason why Thailand's rice export industry is doing so well. People want something a bit different. 
And of course, Thailand is well suited to rice growing. Good climatic conditions and lots of fresh water. Going back to China for a minute, we should mention that at the Rice Research Institute in Huangzhou, they're working on ways of improving rice yields using less water. By yields, you mean the amount they can grow? Yes, they're trying to find ways to get more rice from less land, improve the taste, but also have other things in it besides carbohydrates, so that it's healthier, better for you. Good idea, considering it's the staple food. And then you've got Japan, which is totally self-sufficient when it comes to rice. This is basically because they have a high tariff on imported rice, so everyone buys the homegrown product, and they don't export much. Yes, but you know, even though rice is a kind of sacred crop there, consumption is only half what it was in the 1960s. This trend isn't evident in Thailand or China. Interesting that you mentioned how rice is almost sacred in Japan, because I believe in Thailand it also plays an important cultural role. Absolutely, they have the royal ploughing ceremony every year, which the king always attends, and he actually scatters a new stock of seed to the farmers, who pour into Bangkok for the event. What about the global interest in organic farming? Is there such a thing as organically grown rice? Yes, indeed. And the Japanese are getting quite a taste for it, apparently. There's an experimental farm near the city of Akita in the Japanese rice belt, famous for its sake, by the way, which has pioneered organic rice production, and now it's sold all across the country. It's a bit like the recent popularity of jasmine rice in Thailand, but that's for the export market, of course. Interesting how attitudes change, isn't it? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture's introduction to Insect Biology 101. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon and welcome to Insect Biology 101. I'd like to begin this course with a few remarks about good insects and bad ones. Bugs are all around us and that's both a benefit and an annoyance, sometimes maybe even serious harm. First, let's talk about the good things that insects do for us. Probably the most important insect for humans and maybe for all other life, is the bee. Bees help plants in the process of pollination and thus are necessary to most flowers and fruit-producing trees. That is, they carry pollen from male flowers to female. If it weren't for bees, we'd have very few food plants and no fruit either. In fact, there would be no we. No lesser thinker than Albert Einstein pointed out that, without bees, humanity would be dead within a year or less. We'd starve. It's that simple. That should maybe make us just a little humble. A little less dramatic is the fact that bees also make the honey we eat. Moreover, they produce beeswax, which is useful in candles and is also used as a first-rate furniture polish. Sure, these may not be vital to our lives, but they can serve as reminders of how important bees are. 
That's a point I keep coming back to in this course. Though, in all fairness, I should point out that butterflies aid in pollination as well as bees. Now, here in Michigan, what's the worst part of summer? Yep, that's right, mosquitoes. But I'm talking about helpful insects, right? So let's look at the dragonfly first. If there were no dragonflies, there would be even more mosquitoes. Dragonflies mainly eat mosquitoes and also a few other insects. Yes, that's right. They don't just fly around, and they also help to eliminate harmful insects. So the next time you see a dragonfly, don't you dare kill it. Now, let's talk a little about those harmful insects. Take the mosquitoes I just mentioned as an example. Not so many years ago, mosquitoes here in America weren't just annoying, some were even deadly. They carried malaria and yellow fever. My own ancestor, the Confederate General John Bell Hood, lived through the worst battles of civil war only to die at age 38 from yellow fever. A pest, not a bullet. Well, besides the mosquitoes, in summer there is also a kind of insect that never seems tired. Right, that is the fly. Before I go on talking, I must mention an African fly called the tsetse fly, which feeds on blood and can cause serious diseases in the people and animals that it bites. Besides, it is still a bearer of sleeping sickness, which affects around 300,000 people every year in Africa and can be treated only with toxic drugs that are hard to administer. Worse still, the drugs sometimes don't work. Other insects, of course, destroy food crops. In China, for instance, locusts continue to be a danger to the harvest in some areas. Less important, but still annoying, moths eat people's clothes and dust mites slowly destroy carpets. Worse, but still in the home, termites or white ants eat wood, the wood of your house. If they are not stopped, they can eventually destroy the whole building. Usually they seriously damage a building before anyone even notices them. So, as we all know, insects can be a real trouble. So, what to do? You can go ahead and start killing harmful insects. In the early decades after the communist revolution in China, Chairman Mao encouraged the people to swat every fly they could see. Slogans on the walls of buildings called them little capitalists. But flies reproduce too quickly for this to be a long-term solution. For some decades in the West, to kill insects with chemicals seemed a good remedy. Unfortunately, chemicals can only be used in a limited area for a limited time. It's a small-scale solution. The insects come back. Worse still, some of the poisons used, like DDT, were found harmful to the environment. Many kinds of wildlife, like hawks, were harmed and people in chemical-using rural areas have one of the highest rates of liver cancer in the world. It's no secret that chemicals remain harmful to humans. Like all species, insects adapt to their changing environments at an amazing rate. When a new chemical is introduced to their habitat, the insects that survive are generally the ones with some way of resisting the harmful effects. They then breed with the other survivors, and just like that, insects become resistant to most poison in a few generations. An insect generation, remember, is a couple of months at most. So again, we have to ask, what to do? Well, there are biological solutions. Some of these are pretty simple. One is destroying the insect's habitat. You take away their home or food. Cleaning your kitchen is the best way to prevent roaches. No garbage, no food. Getting rid of marshes and swamps eliminates mosquitoes. Other solutions might include bringing in dragonflies or bats in areas where mosquitoes are many. This is a cheaper alternative to chemicals. Biological methods like this also bring no extra pollution to the environment. But you have to be careful. If you change the environment too much, you might be hurting other forms of life accidentally. One recent method of controlling insect populations involves interrupting their breeding cycle. What does that mean? It means birth control for bugs. Insects are provided with food that makes them unable to reproduce. 
since they can't have babies, the population disappears, or nearly so. And since no young are born, resistance is not a problem, with no young insects developing increased resistance. Interrupt the life cycle, eliminate the bug. It's clear that we must have an understanding of the life cycle of the insect. At least, that's the plan. We'll go into more detail as the course goes along. Now, I will stop here to see whether you have any questions or not. That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Dear viewers, thank you for taking this listening test. Please let me know about your score in the comments section below. Keep on practicing. It's the only way to be successful. We are planning to upload more IELTS helpful videos. Please subscribe to our channel, IELTS Listening. Thank you.